always consider ourselves the people of the sun, the first people. Narragansett originally, as far as in the Algonquin, it's an Algonquin word, it's the people of the point, of the people of near the little waters, which means of all the bays and the inlets. Uh, it is also another word for the people of the rising sun, or those who first see the sun, which means that we're originally from the east. Uh, the Algonquin word has many different meanings, and if you break it up, you can find water, you can find sun, you can find points, you can find inlets. Uh, those are all definitions because one word has many different meanings. For millennia, the Narragansett people lived along the coast of what is now southern Rhode Island. They were the most powerful tribe in the area, ruling over several neighboring tribes in southern New England and New York. But 300 years ago, English settlers nearly destroyed Narragansett civilization. This story is seldom told, but the Narragansett know it well. It is believed that the ancestors of the Narragansett migrated to present-day New England more than 10,000 years ago. They settled along the shores, river valleys, and forests of what is now Rhode Island and grew into a prosperous tribe. By the time the Europeans arrived in the area in the 16th century, the total population of the Narragansett was between 30 and 40,000. The Narragansett lived close to nature in an area rich in food resources. Most of the farming was handled by women, while the men hunted and fished. The basic way of life for the Narragansetts was primarily a subsistence way of life. Uh, the food that they got that was obtained primarily was from the ocean. And this was done not only in the summer but in the winter as well. Uh, they also were very familiar with all the different plants and animals that were in and around the shore. Families erected bark-covered houses called wigwams near their fields and constructed watch houses to keep hungry birds from destroying their crops. The Narragansett were able to build up a food surplus by storing dried crops in baskets for later use. Each family had to provide for themselves everything. They had to provide for themselves the means of farming, which meant their food supply, not only for summer but for winter. They had to supply for themselves their clothing. They had to make their clothing. Also, it wasn't... Uh, a corner store you could go to, and if your ability to work with those things that were pretty or that were wearable or that were attractive to the eye had reached a certain level, then these could become trade items. During the winter, groups of Narragansett families would move to warm longhouses in more sheltered areas where they hunted and ice fished. Naturally, as the winter became harsher and became colder, they moved inland not only for their health and protection as far as from the elements, but also they knew that the, most of the animals would go in further into the forest so that therefore that they would be using, you know, the deer, the skunk, uh, many of the uh, four-legged friends that would help nourish their bodies. Life was competitive, competitive, but you were competitive unto yourself to do the best that you could do for your creator or for the creator since we only knew one. It is also written in the history books that the Narragansett had many. They did not. They had one. Narragansett leaders were called sachems. Most sachems were men, though some were women. The sachems came from royal families in which power usually passed from father to son. Some sachems ruled over small local areas, but others had vast domains, sometimes including other tribes. But the sachems were not dictators. The decisions of the sachems were first reviewed by a council who had to reach an agreement before the decision could be passed. People dissatisfied with the rule of their sachems were free to leave for new territory. Healers called Pauwas performed harvest and winter rituals, communicated with the spirits, and healed the sick and injured. Like the sachems, most healers were men, but some were women. In my capacity as medicine woman, I am to give as much knowledge as I have relative to traditional treatments. There are many of us who are allergic to all man-made and synthesized forms of modern drugs. So it's necessary 
to talk about traditional medicines. There is also the other part of traditional medicine that goes hand in hand, and that's the psychological aspect, where you have to be willing to listen to people, sometimes hours on end to be on call 24 hours a day, because there are those people who want a little ceremony or a little bit of the ancient tradition to go with the modern medicine. Whether it's to make food that is more palatable and healthier for the senior citizens or to uh, prescribe something to a young mother and how she can uh, help herself be healthier to give nourishment to her child. Narragansett were a patrilineal society. When a woman married, she moved in with her husband's family. Several generations usually lived together in one dwelling. Narragansett parents were loving and permissive. They taught their children all the necessary skills, but did not rely on physical punishment. In many cases, you'll find uh, that it's from the views of other people, Narragansett Indian children would may be considered spoiled or sheltered. Unfortunately, that is not so. It's just that there is such a degree of respect for life that the parents envelop their children with that sort of a love and that sort of a kindness. It's a family thing. It's uh, from generation to generation. It's extended from family to family or to, from one family to the next as families go. It's a natural cause for us to be that way. When Italian navigator Giovanni da Verrazzano encountered the Narragansett in 1524, he was impressed by what he saw. These people are the most beautiful and have the most civil customs that we have found on this voyage. They are taller than we are. They are a bronze color. Their hair is long and black. And their manner is sweet and gentle, very much like the manner of the ancients. When we traveled into the interior, we found it as pleasant as I can possibly describe and suitable for every kind of cultivation, grain, wine, or oil. By the early 1600s, Dutch, French, and English traders had begun to arrive in the area in large numbers. The Narragansett quickly entered into trade relations with the Europeans, exchanging animal furs for manufactured goods from Europe. They replaced their stone tools with metal ones and traded some of their newly acquired goods for profit with Indians living further inland. But the material benefits of trade with the Europeans came with a heavy price. As contact with the Europeans increased, a new array of diseases previously unknown in the New World, such as plague, smallpox, and tuberculosis, began to spread quickly through the native population. When the Europeans came, the Narragansetts, so the Native Americans, did not have any resistance to those particular types of diseases uh, because they did not have any immune system. Uh, they were totally, so in many cases, uh, hundreds of people were basically demised. They became ill. Uh, they were not able to ward off, although they tried with a lot of their own, with the medicine men, with a lot of their spiritual leaders. Uh, sometimes that they would just remove themselves from the tribe, hoping that they could sustain themselves. Uh, many thousands of her people died that way. In 1636, a Puritan minister named Roger Williams led the first English settlers into Narragansett country. Williams had been expelled from the Massachusetts Bay Colony for what were considered radical ideas, like the separation of church and state. He and his fellow settlers erected homes along the Providence and Moshassock rivers, hoping to set up an ideal society free of old world corruption. In 1643, Williams contributed to present day knowledge of the Narragansett by publishing a book about their language, religion, and lifestyle, entitled A Key into the Language of America. It is one of the earliest and most important books about Native American people, and one of the most prophetic. Over the course of their trading activities with the Europeans in the 17th century, native hunters began to deplete the supply of fur-bearing animals in the area. At the same time, the native demand for European tools and goods kept rising. As a result, the Narragansett and nearby tribes fell into debt and began feuding among themselves for trading privileges with their new neighbors. 
basically, it's the old European philosophy, divide and conquer. Uh, even though the Indian people themselves as a whole had gotten along with relatively, and they did have friendly competition, it wasn't until they were different, claiming different lands, different areas, so that many of the tribes became antagonistic. To reduce their growing trade deficit, the Narragansett were forced to sell the northern half of Rhode Island and most of the islands of Narragansett Bay. In less than 25 years, the Narragansett lost most of their once vast territory and now found themselves surrounded by English settlements or hostile native tribes. In the summer of 1675, the nearby Wampanoag tribe got caught up in a violent struggle with the English colonies. Wampanoag refugees, led by the chief the colonists called King Philip, fled to Narragansett territory. The colonists demanded that the Narragansett hand over King Philip's refugees. When they refused, the Massachusetts and Connecticut colonies declared war on the tribe. In December of 1675, the Narragansett people retreated to what they thought was a safe haven hidden within their homeland. As they came down through Kingston, they had entered this side of what they called the Warden's Pond. And again, they went deeper into the swamp, past the sandbogs or the quick sandbogs into the areas. Now inside, there was a fortress, but primarily of cedar. And uh, by the way, some of those uh, metal pellets are still there. Some of the old guns are still there, rusted beyond, but you can tell what they were. Uh, they had basically barricaded themselves in, so they felt relatively safe and they had enough food and storage to last for the time that they felt that they could. But English officials had discovered their location and immediately dispatched 1,000 colonial troops to the frozen swamp where they hid. This place where I'm sitting at is an example of how history can be written in two different ways by those who win and those who lose. In 1675, the wintertime, December the 19th, uh, the combined forces of Plymouth, Massachusetts, and Connecticut colonies rallied together to finally defeat the Narragansett Indian tribe. It's considered in the history books, it was written as the Great Swamp Fight. To the Narragansett people, however, it's a completely different story. Indeed, in 1675, between 600 and 800 people were killed here in the Great Swamp. However, it was not a fight. Um, the, the people in camp were women, old men and children who were not fighting. They were massacred. They were shot at as they ran away from the burning um, wigwams in their burning village. Their food supplies for the winter were destroyed. The colonists who knew that women and children stayed in the villages while the men fought knew perfectly well that they were not fighting warriors, but they were killing people. They were killing children and women and non-fighters in the whole battle. The state of Rhode Island continues to refer to this place as the Great Swamp Fight. We continue to refer to it 320 years later as the Great Swamp Massacre. A year of fighting followed the massacre. When it was over, less than 200 Narragansett survived. Over the course of 40 years, the English had managed to claim the entire Narragansett territory, and in one year, they had wiped out 95% of the population. The outcome of the actual war to the Narragansett people itself really was the beginning rather than the end. It was the beginning because at that point they learned that they could no longer trust uh, many of the whites of those that came into land. It was the beginning because they had to reestablish themselves. Uh, they basically, what one would term today as basically go underground, although history books state it was the ending. And because it was the beginning, we're still here. After the war, the few surviving Narragansett merged with the Niantic tribe and established a Narragansett reservation in 1709. Over the course of the 18th century, the Narragansett lost most of this land as they labored to pay off debts. But even as they began to adopt non-native customs, they always found ways to hang on to their own traditions. Many of them converted to a form of Christianity patterned after Narragansett ways of worship. And in 1750, they built a structure called the Narragansett Indian Church, which doubled as a tribal gathering place.
a main reason for having the Narragansett Indian Church was because years and years ago it was a meeting house and there again at this meeting house it was where the Indians could meet where the women will sing their church songs but you see while the women were singing you know the old rugged cross or whatever that the men were still having their meetings and they were still holding their council meetings down by the council rocks still maintaining some of their ways in the late 1700s the narragansett abandoned rule by their sachems in favor of an elected governor and council by this time most narragansett were working as farmers or working class laborers in the late 1800s, the U.S. adopted a new policy toward the native population. Reservation lands were to be divided into small family-owned units. This policy, called allotment, would end the communal ownership of land traditional to the native way of life. In 1879, the state of Rhode Island used this policy to force the Narragansett to sell off their remaining land, after which the Narragansett ceased to exist as an official tribe under Rhode Island law. But the Narragansett people did manage to keep their church and continued to hold traditional gatherings. In the 1930s, the allotment policy was replaced by more progressive policies under the Roosevelt administration. These policies helped the Narragansett to reorganize as a tribe in 1934. Two years later, a Narragansett hero appeared. His name was Ellison Brown, more popularly known as Tarzan Brown. In 1936, at age 22, Tarzan Brown became the youngest person to win the Boston Marathon. Later that same year, he became the only man to run and win two 26-mile marathons on consecutive days. In 1939, he won the Boston Marathon again, prompting many to call him the greatest long-distance runner in the world. While he never again attained the heights he'd reached in the 30s, Tarzan Brown remains an important figure for modern Narragansett. By the late 60s and 70s, civil rights and ethnic identity became major public issues in America, and Native Americans, including the Narragansett, became more vocal in demanding their rights. Recently, the Narragansett have won several victories in Rhode Island courts. In 1978, they reclaimed 1,800 acres in the heart of their homeland. In 1983, they were officially recognized as a tribe by the U.S. government. And in 1985, despite strong opposition from the town of Charlestown, the Narragansett had their 1,800 acres of land declared a reservation, making it eligible for federal funding and exempt from property taxes. Today, the core population of Narragansett around the Charlestown area is about 300. The vast majority live like their non-Indian neighbors, a major challenge for the modern Narragansett people is finding a balance between their mainstream lives and their traditional beliefs. When our, some of our young people go to school, um, they have a lot of their family and traditional values that they keep in place. And sometimes um, a lot of the school officials or other children may not understand it. Um, but I think a lot of our young people right now are learning to deal with um, po both the traditional values and the contemporary values when they go into the school system. I think now they're becoming a little bit more um, assertive as far as explaining to the teacher, explaining to the administrator, or explaining to other youth why they don't do certain things. Um, and not to be ashamed of it, because all because we're maybe different, have different values than different people, doesn't mean that it's wrong. I attended school until fourth grade, the public school there, and discovered well, I can't even say discovered, but it was about when I was 10 years old that I realized that I could not stay in that community. The hostility, the ignorance, um, the, the animosity that was there in that community um, against anyone who was not um, a, a white swamp Yankee was just too much. A lot of them now are starting to go to college full time, um, starting to be more assertive. Um, sharing our traditional value with people so people uh, don't assume things about us is a challenge still, but a lot, I think a lot of the young people are adapting to it.
And when I went to college, I met a lot of other Native people from across the country, and some of them have become, you know, my, my very, very close friends. And I enjoyed that because I learned more about other people, other Native people and other cultures. I've always been taught that my, my, my heritage, my culture, my Indianness comes first, but by the same token, I'm supposed to reap the benefits of um, modern European society, you know, take the best from, from both worlds and walk in that balance. And there's times, you know, when I was younger, I found it really hard because I'd go to school and I'd want to have everything that my peers had and be like, not, not be like them, but, you know, but do the things that they did and because of financial restrictions or because of um, regional restrictions, you know, or whatever, it was impossible. And then as, as I got older, um, my purpose and I guess why I'm, why I'm me became more clear to me and I've learned to, to walk in that balance. Many people are working hard to help Narragansett children overcome the low self-esteem caused by the negative images of Native Americans in mainstream culture. The idea is to get uh, these kids interested in careers in science and engineering. And the key idea is that you can work as a scientist or engineer and still be Native American. If you look at the total number of Native Americans involved in science and engineering at professional levels in this country uh, and, and relate that to the total population, it's extremely small. Uh, just, uh, just isn't anyone. There's no role models to speak of. And uh, there's many people just aren't aware that there's a career. Uh, they're finding out that uh, scientists and engineers are real people, that they're fun to work with. And the stuff that they do, that it's, you know, it's, I guess they're amazed that uh, you can get paid for having fun. And that work isn't something that's drudgery that you have to go off and do every day. That it's something you look forward to do. And uh, that's the kind of stuff that we're trying to get across. And what we're seeing now is students, I'll give you an example, a student who I know never really went to school very much. Last summer he missed the bus. He hitchhiked to get to the camp. And it's about 15 miles. Uh, we were a little upset that he hitchhiked, but, uh, and then I, you know, his, uh, we had, uh, I remember one of the uh, uncles of one of the students last summer said, that's the first time that his nephew ever wanted to go to school. With their recent legal victories in the Rhode Island courtrooms, the Narragansett have become an increasingly important political presence in their traditional homeland. I've found since coming to Rhode Island, becoming state archaeologist in 1982, that the uh, strongest advocate for the preservation of archaeological sites deal dealing with Native American history is the Narragansett Indian tribe. Some people, non-Indians in particular, think of uh, tend to think of archaeological sites dealing with Native Americans as sort of curiosities, you know, things that are interesting but maybe not really important, things that are frivolous to study, things that are on the peripheral of, periphery of, uh, of real history, you know, a white man's history. Um, but in working with tribal members, what it does is uh, instill a real strong importance into these things. This office is housed in the uh, what used to be the Colony House, and then when Rhode Island became a state after the Revolutionary War, it became one of the state houses in Rhode Island. And in 1880, the General Assembly met here to formally detribalize the uh, Narragansett Indian tribe. The federal government uh, has since determined, prodded by a lawsuit from the Narragansetts, that that was an illegal act. And uh, tribal status was conferred uh, on the Narragansetts formally by the federal government in 1983. And uh, it is somewhat ironic that uh, a group of us, the Historical Preservation Commission, and a state of Rhode Island which now seeks to protect the archaeological sites associated with the history of these people is in this building. And uh, what happened within these walls uh, 100 years ago is very different from what's happening within these walls now. For the Narragansett, protecting archaeological sites from development means more than the preservation of Native history. It's an expression of a deeply held belief, shared by virtually all Native American societies, in the sacredness of the land. If you build your house on the edge of water, and your cesspool and your storage run into the water, or into the ground that surrounds the water, that's defiling those things. And that is one of the things that we Indians object to greatly. It owns you for sure. Mother Earth definitely owns you, but you certainly don't own it. 
you can't possibly own it. And that's why you have to be kind to it and nice to it. Most of the time now, the children, they sit in front of the TV. They see the animals on TV and they see some of these things. But they should really take a walk out in the woods and really see the leaves and the twigs and even the spiders and the snakes and the salamanders and the turtles down by the pond and the fish and really get to touch and feel and see some of these things. Television is nice, don't get me wrong, but when you don't really live with this and see it for yourself, it's kind of imaginary. Why not encompass everything that's out there? I mean, the lowliest, like as I said, from that ant's nest on the ground, you know, to, to the birds, to the trees that you sit under, to the wind that's blowing. Use this, enjoy it. To me, this is life. I mean, this is loving. I mean, and, and, and don't destroy anything unless it's really for your survival. Every August, the Narragansett people gather to remember their past and renew their traditions. I would have been about a month old at my first August meeting, and I've been at every one since. The differences, when I was younger, I could run around or, or you know, help a little bit and then run away. But as I've gotten older, I've been given more responsibility as to what I'm going to do. When I was a little, uh, I still put my Indian dress on. My mother gave me a little dress and, and with beads and and I still, at the time, I didn't know what we were doing, but I still dan did my dances with people, with my Indian people, and I had fun. And uh, when I was getting older, I understood the more I wore it. For the Narragansett, there will always be a connection between the past, the land, and Native traditions. The Narragansett and others are working hard to keep those connections strong. What I've done in my work, I've made a conscious effort to not separate the past and the present. That when I write about Narragansett Indian history 2,000 years ago, I always connect it to the people that are alive now and follow that thread through. Now that thread, that course that connects the past and the present is a pretty crazy trail sometimes and a lot happened between 2,000 years ago and now. But the fact remains that they're the same people and they're connected by that history. And I think that as archaeologists and as historians of Native Americans, scholars of Native, Ameri Native American history, we have a responsibility to make that connection clear. What's in the book's not necessarily so. Let's get the true history and put it down. And then I think from there, when, when people start getting, reading true history of what actually happened to Native Americans, then maybe they'll get a better understanding. I mean, a lot of times when you read a history book, it's like uh, uh, Indians were savages and all they did was kill settlers. And so you get a very negative view on Native Americans, or you get a very romantic size view on Native Americans. We, we just want a, a real realistic view of what we really are as a people, whether the things that we do are good or bad, but let's make sure that it's true. We know who we are, we know our history, our culture, and we have maintained it and we will continue to do that. We came from the sea and we reside by the sun. That is us, the Narragansetts.